Hello everyone and welcome back to Asian Noob. This video is the final one of my four-part ultimate guide series for Return of Rome, in which I covered fundamentals and economy in part one, buildings and technologies in part two, military and combat in part three, and water and navy in this video. Since the Return of Rome DLC is a brand new game mode for AOE 2 players, I figured that there would be tons of you who would either need a refresher on how AOE 1 played out, or need to learn the game from the ground up to get up to speed with the rest. I've linked below all four parts of my series in the pinned comment below, and I've ensured that I'm as concise as possible, as tons of info is crammed into each part of this series. Alright, without further ado, let's dive into the water and navy of Return of Rome. Unlike military and combat, water gameplay in Return of Rome is significantly simpler compared to AoE 2, so this video should be quite easy for you folks to wrap your head around very quickly. Let's first cover fishing and trade, then dive into water combat last. In the Stone Age, you can train fishing boats from the dock and basically nothing else. They cost 50 wood each to build and cannot be harmed in the Stone Age. Also, as a quick reminder, villagers can also drop off shore fish into the dock in Return of Rome DLC, so keep that in mind. There's not much else to cover here. There might be some build orders down the line that might ask you to build fishing boats in the Stone Age, but given that we age up so quickly in Return of Rome, this is completely dependent on the sieve you have, what game mode and map you're playing on, and some fish RNG as well. I do suggest you check out pro build orders on water or hybrid maps regarding optimized fish booms. In the Tool Age, you get access to two more units, which are the Light Transports and the Scout Ships. Light Transports can only carry five units, and yes, this means that it can fit five elephants, but not six villagers as per typical AOE logic. You can upgrade these to Heavy Transports all the way in the Iron Age for a cheap cost, and it's worth it to pick up as Heavy Transports are faster, tankier, and carry double the units at 10 per boat. I'll get into the Scout Ships later in the Combat section. In the Bronze Age, you can upgrade your fishing boats to fishing ships for a measly 50 food and 100 wood. The fishing ship is better in every way, as it has more HP, sails faster, and carries more fish than the fishing boat. So it's definitely worth the upgrade assuming you still have access to a decent amount of safe fish on the map. You also get access to the trade boat in the Bronze Age as well, and you can immediately upgrade it to the merchant ship for 200 food and 75 wood as well. The trading system from AOE 1 was entirely scrapped, as it is now akin to how trade works in AOE 2, i.e. magically creating gold out of thin air as some of you mentioned in the previous videos. In other words, you can now trade with any dock on the map, and the further the other dock is, the more gold generated per trip in return. That said, although the merchant ship does not generate more gold per trip, it has a whopping 80 more HP and, more importantly, is significantly faster than the trade boat. Hence, effectively, it does speed up gold generation significantly and is a must research if you have water trade set up, just like how the caravan upgrade is a must have in AOE 2 as well. That wraps up fishing and trading on water in Return of Rome, so let's dive into the combat now. Going back to the Tool Age, the Scout Ship line is basically the galley line in AOE 2, in which all Archer upgrades affect them as well. Hence, in Return of Rome, the range of the Scout Ship line can be improved through woodworking, artisanship and craftsmanship from the market, attack damage through alchemy from the government center, and accuracy versus moving targets through ballistics from the government center again. Unlike AOE 2 though, there is no rock paper scissors system on water here. Hence, water combat is basically determined by 1. Who can outproduce the other, 2. Whose sieve bonuses, if any, outperforms the other, and 3. Who can micro his or her ships better. This also applies to the Bronze Age by the way, as the War Galley is still the only military unit on water. It's a galley versus galley fight until the very final age, the Iron Age. Speaking of the Iron Age, we finally get some variety. There are three units now to choose from, the Trireme, the Fire Galley, and the Catapult Trireme or the Juggernaut. The Trireme is a direct upgrade from the War Galley, so your ships from the previous ages can be upgraded as usual. The Fire Galley is a new unit that unlocks in the Iron Age only after you research the War Galley upgrade first. This isn't written on the tech tree, but it's how it works. The Fire Galley is basically the anti-ship unit, just like the Fire Galleys in AoE 2. And finally, the Catapult Trireme is the land sieging ship, which are akin to the Cannon Galleons from AoE 2 that are used to bring down buildings from afar. The interaction between the Fire Galleys and Triremes are kinda similar to that of the Galleons and the Fast Fire ships. In small numbers, triremes do get destroyed by the fire galleys. They also cannot flee as the fire galleys are faster than triremes, so if you're caught, you'll have to make the decision of cutting your losses by either engaging or giving away a few ships for free to save the majority of the fleet. In larger numbers though, things do get complicated. As is the case in AoE 2 as well, a critical mass of triremes can still one-shot fire galleys, which means that, if you do micro well, you can deal with fire galleys when commanding large fleets. 
There are also two other important considerations here. First, triremes do not have any frame delay, so they shoot immediately after you order them to. When we couple this with the superior military control that Return of Rome introduced with an AV2's engine, shooting and kiting is actually very easy and smooth with triremes and tips the engagement in their favor in certain scenarios. Second, triremes are not only cheaper overall, but only cost wood, as opposed to the fire galleys that cost 20 more resources overall and 40 gold apiece. Hence, this engagement also begs the question of how much gold is left on the map, as you may be okay trading relatively unfavorably into fire galleys if you know that your opponent cannot sustain fire galley production much longer due to the limited gold on the map. The catapult trireme and its subsequent legendary upgrade the juggernaut can only be researched after you've researched trireme, and there's not much else to say about them. They do also cost gold, so they don't really add value to water engagements and are mostly there to take down towers or put pressure on the shoreline. There's also one final quick comment I want to make, and it's that you shouldn't be afraid to siege land with triremes directly if you have large enough numbers. For example, a shoreline defended by three fully upgraded ballista towers may make you think that you need the juggernauts, but a group of 20 or so triremes alone can deal with those towers very easily. Yes, ideally, you should be sieging from afar with juggernauts to not suffer any losses, but if you have the momentum and cannot wait or afford gold intensive catapult triremes, then regular triremes will do just fine in numbers. Remember that there are no castles in Return of Rome, so triremes are overall very strong into almost all land units and structures. But going back to water to touch on what I've alluded to before, water combat in Return of Rome is really reduced to only two main units and just a handful of parameters. Your macro and micro, the bonuses of the civilizations at play, the resources on the map, and how much production you can sustain are going to determine the winner here. There is no strategy of army comp because there are no units to select from. Hence, unlike land combat, you most definitely need to know your civ matchups going into water maps as you cannot play with just general knowledge of units in this guide. For example, if you're up against the Hittites as the Assyrians, you cannot match them on water due to the additional range they receive on their ship's tool age onwards. If it's a 1v1, your best bet is to land on their island and cause chaos on land instead. That's because if you two are equally skilled, there's just no way you're winning water or protecting your fish pound for pound in that matchup. In short, unlike land combat, water gameplay in Return of Rome is very shallow and limited. Its balance is out of whack in my opinion, especially since a handful of civs are basically unplayable in water maps, and the complete lack of comeback mechanism like the demo ships provide in AOE 2 really hurts the prospect of exciting water gameplay. Once you lose water early to a skilled player, he or she will make it impossible for you to get back into the game. Hence, since Age of Empires DE still exists as the OG game state, I do think that the developers need to add a third or fourth new ship type to Return of Rome specifically, and definitely introduce some counterplay potential for the Tool and Bronze Ages specifically. Winning water should not be this one dimensional in this game. But hey, that's just my opinion, so do let me know what you think about water gameplay yourself in the comments below. Thank you for spending some of your time with us, as that wraps up my summary of Water and Navy and my Ultimate Guide series as a whole for Return of Rome. Be sure to check out parts 1, 2, and 3 if you haven't already to get up to speed on all land aspects of the game. With the final video now wrapped up, I hope that you find this guide series helpful, and I would appreciate it if you could share it with others who you think might find it helpful as well. As always, thanks for watching everyone, be sure to subscribe for more AOE content, and see you all in the next one.